Shalom to you and welcome to Treasured Inheritance Ministry. I'm Yosef Ben Avram. And today I am excited to share with you this new teaching that I've entitled Lydosia and the Messiantics. Now I know for some of you immediately you're going to be like, Brother Yosef, how can you call your teaching that? But the truth of the matter is, brothers and sisters, that there is a great shifting that is taking place in the body of Messiah Yeshua. And you know, to become a priest means that you pass from death to life. And there are so many people today that are so interested in rather acquiring knowledge over an intimate relationship with Messiah Yeshua. They will say that they love him, but yet they lack the transforming power of his Ruach in their lives. And not only that, many people have substituted an intimate relationship with Messiah Yeshua over just Torah study. And because of this, many today are denying their faith in Messiah Yeshua and they are returning to Judaism. They are returning to other things or finding alternative ways to have a living faith. This, brothers and sisters, is what we call apostasy. We are to have nothing to do with those who deny Messiah Yeshua. We, are, we read it in the book of Jude where it says, Be careful of such people. And brothers and sisters, I pray that as we get into this teaching, that you will come to understand the heart of Messiah Yeshua, that he is desiring a people of his presence. He is desiring people who will be, become the protectors of his, of his presence. Not just people that have this great amount of head knowledge. No, that's not what he wants. He wants people who will do the works of Yeshua, just as his son came to manifest his character upon the earth. So Yahweh is looking for a man, a woman, who will do exactly that. So brothers and sisters, without further ado, let's get into this teaching. Let's pray, and then let's get in. Father, we come to you in the wonderful and powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach. And Father, we want to pray today that as we get into your word, Father, that you will speak to your people. Father, that every preconceived idea will be removed in the name of Yeshua. That people will come with hearts open, with minds, Father, to to come and receive and hearts to receive. And Father, that they will come to understand that there is a great change taking place. Father, that we're either going to be on the side of the dead or we're going to find ourselves on the side of the living, but that it is going to take something from us, Father, to really become the people that you want us to be. We can no longer be found at old, dirty water holes. Father, we need to change. We need to mature. We need to understand, Father, that we are to move into all the covenants that you have set before us. Not setting up camp, camp, Father, at salvation. Not setting up camp, Father, just a Torah study, but becoming the express image of Messiah Yeshua upon this earth. And, Father, to do that, we need to be people of your presence. We need to be people who have been rooted by faith in Messiah Yeshua. We cannot be rooted in anything else and we cannot afford to deny Messiah Yeshua as the Messiah. If we do that, Father, we apostatize and we have no place in the family and in the kingdom of Messiah Yeshua. So, Father, I want to pray today that as we get into your word, as we discuss this congregation, Lydosia, and the current state of the Messianic movement, I pray, Father, that we will have eyes to see and ears to hear. And, Father, that we will grow and that we will mature and that we will become, Father, partakers in that inheritance that you desire for us to be partakers in. And we thank you for this. In Messiah Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, if you have your Bible with you, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Colossians chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 16. And it says the following, it says, When this letter has been read among you, cause it to be read also in the assembly of the Lydosians, and that you also read the letter from Lydosia. Now there is much debate about that letter from Lydosia, and the scope of this teaching is not to discuss that. The scope of this teaching is to discuss what Rav Shul was saying. He was saying to the Colossians, you know, brothers and sisters, this is what I want you to understand. And I want what I'm telling this congregation also to be read out in the congregation to the Lydosia. This letter is basically what we call a circulating letter. And like I said, so he makes the statement in his letter that this, this letter to the Colossians needs to also be read out to the Lydosians. And you know, it was this verse that caught my attention recently as I read the letter of the Colossians. And I was praying actually at that time about the current state of the body of Messiah Yeshua. And I know that for many, this teaching will be hard to digest. Yet the contents, brothers and sisters, hear me out. The contents is of vital importance to you. You know, over and over I have stated that the Messianic movement is not immune to Yahweh's judgment. Yet they are also not immune to Yahweh's rebuke. 
You know, if we believe that apostasy can and has been happening in the church, then we need to understand that it will and is happening in the messianic faith. You know, those who once believed in the supremacy of Yeshua are now denying that he is the Messiah. People who once believed in the supremacy of Yeshua are denying that he is now the Messiah. You know, others that once believed in the working of the Ruach, they have turned their back on all truth for a substitute faith. Brothers and sisters, it's a faith that was not once for all delivered to the saints. It is a faith that is so phony. It looks nothing like the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. You know, instead, it's a faith that has a form of godliness. Yet as the scriptures tell us, it denies the very power of that faith. Now, hear me out. For a while now, Treasured Inheritance Ministry has made a point of stating that we are not a Hebrew Roots ministry. Neither are we a Messianic affiliated ministry. Let me say that again. Treasured Inheritance Ministry has made a point of stating we are not a Hebrew Roots ministry. Neither are we a Messianic affiliated ministry. We simply follow our Messiah and teach His truth and keep His commandments as the way to walk righteously. Brothers and sisters, we as a ministry will not be limited by a label created by men that is slowly starting to show its true colors. You know, over and over we've been shown that there is a change, and I've shown this in all the teachings that I've done over the last couple of years. I've tried to explain to people that there is a change that is taking place in the body of Messiah. You know, there are those that are happier in following the footsteps of men, and because of this, they've actually lost their passion and their intimacy with Yeshua. You know, instead, these people are happier to be led by men that seem to spoon-feed them and wow them with all new kinds of theories and, and, and ideas and theologies and teachings week in and week out. When you look at these groups, brothers and sisters, you cannot help to notice there is no pursuit of intimacy. There is no pursuit of holiness, holiness that is built, brothers and sisters, on true heartfelt worship. These people, brothers and sisters, they are happy to sit week in, week in and week out being taught the Torah portions. Yet they struggle to fully understand what the Torah is actually all about. Week in and week out, they're still struggling to really define what the Torah is all about. You know, they sit in their groups with heart issues. And these heart issues, as we have said, are never being dealt with. Why? Because those who teach them don't see the necessity to deal with the heart. They only see the necessity to deal with people's heads. Because that gives them power. And you know, brethren, these are serious issues that we need to speak up about. Because of the heart of many, they are being misled by the spirit of the age. A spirit of pride, brothers and sisters, and that, that's the honest truth. It's a spirit of pride that has now crept into the body because we are so filled and puffed up with our own head knowledge. But these people lack the fire and they lack the ruach to have the clear perspective to see that the times and the seasons that we are in are changing. They have changed a long while ago. Yet many are happy to stay in the camp where they find themselves. A camp that is filled with metzora. It is filled with spiritual leprosy that is covering the walls and causing people to become spiritually sick. You know, Rav Shul, in his letter to the Colossians, continually urges them and the Lydosians to beware of those who come into the congregation to entice them with vain words. And you know, brethren, that is exactly what is happening today. Because man has substituted intimacy for the words of men, they are being misled by the ones that they have appointed to teach them. Let's take a look at what it says in the book of Colossians chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 1. It says, For I desire to have you know how greatly I struggle for you, and for those at Lydosia, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be comforted, that being knit together in love, and gaining all riches and all the assurance of understanding, that they may know the mystery of Elohim, both of the Father and of Messiah, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden. You know, brothers and sisters, Rav Shul makes it clear 
that only in Messiah Yeshua is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Not in anything else, not in your Zohar, not in your Talmud, not in your rabbinic teachings, not in anything else. But in an intimate relationship rooted in Messiah Yeshua, built up in Him. You see, if you want to know the mysteries of Yahweh, if you want to know the mysteries of the kingdom of Messiah Yeshua, get to know Yeshua intimately. That's what you need to do. And that, brothers and sisters, will cost you something. It will cost you your time. It will cost you an intimate time relationship with Yeshua. Something that people just don't seem to want to pursue. It's easier to jump on the internet, get all the information that you need, and then go out and teach it as if it's your own. But it's difficult to sit with Yeshua for an hour a day, maybe two hours, maybe even three hours, just worshipping Him. Sometimes not even saying anything to Him, but allowing Him to say something to you. When last did you hear the voice of Yeshua in your life? Let's go on in verse 4. It says, Now this I say, that no one may delude you with persuasiveness of speech. For though I am absent in flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing and seeing your order and the steadfastness of your faith. You know, just in the days of Shaul, so too today, brothers and sisters, so many are being misled by teachers with persuasiveness of speech. Convincing people that you don't have to be a believer in Messiah Yeshua to actually be saved. Just keep the commandments and you'll be saved. We're going to see as we go on in this teaching how many false things have been taught to people in the Messianic movement. Just like we were taught falsehood in the church, so we've been taught falsehood now because people lack the spirit of discernment. The biggest problem with the Messianic faith is that they seek teachers and reject everything else. They seek teachers and reject the prophet, the apostle, the evangelist. Man, they reject everything and they hold fast to teachers that wow them. You know, there is only one model that is given to us for maturity and it's found in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. And it says, who gave us that model? No one else. No Beth Din, no rabbinic institution. Messiah Yeshua gave it to us through his death and resurrection. He gave unto us the fivefold ministry for the edification of the body of Messiah Yeshua so that we will all come to be a perfect man. Telios. Or the Hebrew Tamim. You see, teaching only makes one part of that model. Teaching only fills one part of the five-fold ministry. We need the rest because why? Rav Shul comes in and he says, I am a master builder. He was an apostle that came in and did what? He first broke down and then he built up. Today, all we're doing is we're building on an old foundation, thinking that everything's going to be okay. It's not. We need to be broken in order to be built. Brokenness leads to openness in the spiritual realm. So then the question is, do we really want to mature? Do we actually really want to mature? Or is it that the body of Messiah Yeshua wants to be wise in our own understanding? And that wisdom has now turned into puffed up pride. Verse 6 continues and says, as therefore you receive Messiah Yeshua, walk in Him. You received Messiah Yeshua, so now why are you going back to the elementary things of your faith? Why are you denying Him coming in the flesh? It says that we are to be rooted, built up in Him. Not rooted up in your knowledge. Rooted in Him. And established in the faith, not a faith that we see today in the Messianic movement, the faith that was once delivered to the apostles from the very beginning. A faith that showed the power and the presence of the Master. A faith that stood. Even as you were taught to bounding in it with thanksgiving. You know, brothers and sisters, today in the Messianic camp, people are being built up by teachings and not in the Messiah Yeshua. They are not rooted in Him at all. And because of this, they are being deceived and allowing teachers in, teachers, brothers and sisters, teachers that do not even believe 
in Messiah Yeshua. They do not even believe that he truly is the son of Elohim. And 1 John chapter 2 and verse 23 tells us, pardon me, no one denying the son has the father. The one confessing the son has the father as well. So if you do not confess Messiah Yeshua as coming in the flesh, as <coughs> pardon me, I just recovered from laryngitis. So please forgive me if I cough every now and again. But we need to understand that the Bible says no one denying the father I mean, no one denying the Son has the Father. So if you deny the Son, you automatically do not have the Father. No matter whether you are Jewish, no matter whether you are the Pope, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you need to accept and you need to acknowledge that the Son is the express image of the Father and that He came in the flesh. Let's go on to verse 8. Be careful that you don't let anyone rob you through his philosophy. Don't let anyone come in with their philosophy and their vain deceit, which is after the traditions of men and not after the power and the presence of Yeshua. And then he goes on and says, after the elements of the world and not after Messiah. There he says it. For in him, in Messiah Yeshua, are the fullness of the Godhead which dwells bodily. It dwells in his flesh, the fullness of Yahweh, dwells in Messiah Yeshua. That's why we need to be rooted in Him if we really want to be children of the light. Because He says in verse 10, And in Him, not in your knowledge, not in your own Torah studies, not in the way that you think or your religion, no, in Him, in Messiah Yeshua, that's in whom you are made full. Why? Because he is the head of all principality and power. He is the one who rules and reigns supreme over everything else. Without him, you have nothing. Absolutely nothing. Man, brothers and sisters, I get excited because I don't understand how people can be denying him. You know, we are living in a time of the fulfillment of Scripture. And this should cause us to wake up to the truth. You know, the problems that were in the Lydosian congregation are the same problems today in the Messianic camp. And the reason for this is because they chose to substitute intimacy for knowledge. And because of this, they have remained in the, that camp. They have remained in the Mosaic Covenant. Yet what they don't understand is how much they're actually missing. You see, brothers and sisters, for a long time I've been teaching on the covenants and the importance of maturing in all of them. And today those in the Messianic faith have gotten stuck at the second covenant, the Mosaic, which is all about the Torah, all about keeping Yahweh's festivals and commandments. But we are not supposed to set up camp there. We're supposed to take and learn, apply it and mature. It's supposed to be a progressive walk so that we finally get to look like the elder brother. So that we begin to look like the express image of Yeshua by the lives that we live, the way that we speak, our actions with one another, and the way that we, the, the way that we live as a community. Like I said, Rav Shul warned the Colossians as well as the Lydosians of vain philosophy and empty words. And in the book of Revelation, we read the words of Yeshua to the Lydosians. And you know, I cannot help but see how it applies today to the Messianic faith. We need to remember that our aim is to have the right garments on. Throughout all the teachings that I've done over the last couple of years, one of the main things that I've taught on is having the right garments. Garments speak about our flesh. Our flesh needs to be redeemed. We cannot enter into the Holy of Holies with a hint of of flesh. The Bible tells us that no flesh may glory in the presence of Yahweh. This is why the entire armor is all about putting off our flesh and putting on Messiah Yeshua so that we can stand in the presence of Yahweh. Yet unfortunately today, brothers and sisters, only a remnant is truly hearing and obeying. 
Yeshua wants us to be those who do his works. And his works are not just keeping the Torah. His works are going out and making disciples of all nations. His works are doing the Great Commission. His works is being a light to all. Standing up for justice, righteousness. When we do these things, we begin to reflect him to the nations. And they will glorify our Father in heaven. Now, Laodosia is rebuked for their apathy and bad attitude. Basically, <laughs> pardon me, basically they think that they're spiritually full, but in actual fact, they are spiritually bankrupt. Let's take a look. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 14. And it says, And to the messenger of the assembly in Laodosia write, The Amen, the trustworthy and the true witness, the beginning of all the creation of Elohim says this. Yeshua speaking and he says this. I know your works. That you are neither cold nor hot. I would have that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. And I've said this before in all the teachings. You can only vomit something out that was once in. This is not talking about unbelievers. It's talking about believers. Because you say, rich I am, and I am made rich, and need none at all, and do not know that you are wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so that you become rich, and white garments so that you become dressed, so that the shame of your nakedness might not be shown, and anoint your eyes with ointment so that you see. As many as I love, I reprove and discipline. So be ardent and repent. Brothers and sisters, the key to the presence of Yeshua is repentance. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I shall come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now, before we continue, we need to understand that the seven congregations speak about seven different specific congregations in the time of John. But at the same time, they prophetically speak about the congregations before the return of Yeshua. And I believe that this is the congregation. This congregation, Lydosia, is the most common at this present time. And it is the one that Yeshua is rebuking for many reasons. Now, these are the ones that are lukewarm. They are found in the Lydosian congregation. And they are unresponsive to Yeshua's call. And I truly believe that this congregation is an accurate picture today of what Messianic communities are like at present. Now, when we begin to see the full picture of what Abba is wanting from his children, and we begin to line it up with the Messianic movement, we begin to see that they're simply failing and falling short of becoming the redeemed people of Yahweh. The redeemed people of Yahweh as he truly wants them to be a light to the nations, a powerful force through whom the manifest presence of Yahweh can be revealed. They are lacking in so many areas. Now, before we continue, I feel that we need to give some historical background to Laodosia to truly understand what I believe that Yeshua is likening this congregation to and why it is been likened to the Messianics of today. Now, it's important to understand that Yahweh always has a remnant and that his desire is for us to mature and become the children of his power and presence. This is why there was a remnant that was left in the church and they embraced their break heritage. Yet this was only a stop on a greater journey. We were never, like I said, meant to just leave the church, embrace the Torah and stay there. No, we were meant to mature and continue to mature until finally we become the bride. The priests of righteousness. Now I said if you have listened to the covenant teachings then you'll understand this. Yet today many in the Messianic movement have set up camp and they are unwilling to move forward. That's why only a remnant in the end of days will truly get it and do all that Abba desires. This is why Yeshua continues to state be ardent and repent. You see brothers and sisters repentance is an ongoing thing not a once off thing. 
And today, many think that once they have repented of past sins, they no longer need to examine their hearts anymore. And this is contrary to the word of Yahweh. Rav Shul continually says, examine, test and see if you are truly in the faith. We are to examine ourselves on a daily basis. And this is a big problem in the Messianic faith. Many no longer feel that there is a need to repent and examine and test to see if they are truly in the faith. That faith that I spoke about in the very beginning. A faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. A faith that exhibits the power of Yeshua, not just head knowledge. Brothers and sisters, so many people today are walking around with so much head knowledge. It's actually scary. It really, really is scary. Now, let's take a look at some of the history about this place. And you can get the, the reference to this in the notes that I will post on the website um, a little bit later. So, first century Lydosia sat astride two major trade routes. And the first road ran from Rome eastward into Asia Minor, then beyond to Sicilia where Paul was actually born. At Derby is where it split. Now, one leg went to the south through Damascus and on to Egypt. The other leg struck across the east to Mesopotamia, um, basically south through Damascus and on into Egypt. The other leg struck across, pardon me, I missed the part. The other leg, like I said, struck across the east to Mesopotamia, the ancient home of Babylon. So let me say that again. The road ran from Rome eastward into Asia Minor then beyond to Sicilia where Paul was born. At Derby it split. One leg went into the south through Damascus and on into Egypt, whereas the other leg struck across the east to Mesopotamia, the ancient home of Babylon. Now, connecting the city to southern Europe through Byzantium, the second route entered Lydosia from the north and continued to the Mediterranean. Now, what I found interesting when I dug in and I, I remember when I was studying to be a pastor and we did these um, seven congregations, you know, we always learned about the problem they had with the water. But the rest of the things, um, you know, you kind of just touch the surface. And it's very interesting to do a little bit of historical background so that you can draw the connections and begin to see, hey, but wait a minute, the way that it was in that city is actually the way that the Messianic faith is today. So let's have a look. The founders built the city in the Lysus Valley where these routes actually crossed one another. And this provided Lydosia with unlimited opportunities for trade, but it also caused other significant problems. You see, ideally, prosperous cities are built close to abundant natural resources. That's the way that a good builder would actually build a city, especially close to water, because you need water in order for your city to grow. And you know, great cities are usually founded on deep natural harbors or on the banks of rivers where water is abundant. But unfortunately, Lydosia was not established near an adequate water supply. And it was more driven by trade, so its builders located it where the roads crossed. And they weren't too worried about this need for water. They were more worried about how much money they could make. So, however, the city had much in its favor and of special note were its three main industries. And I found this interesting. The Lydosians produced a glossy black wool that was prized by the wealthy all over the world. And no one knows whether its rich color came from a particular strain of sheep that they bred in the area or whether they dyed it. But the quality of the wool is indisputable. It was brilliant. It was majestic. It was beautiful. Now, in fact... They cornered the market in this commodity, producing tremendous wealth. They were the, 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 the biggest producers of this glossy black wool. They dominated this commodity. Now, their second business was medicine. Lydosia boasted of one of the most renowned medical schools in the world. And with it came all of its associated industries like pharmaceuticals and the likes. They produced the world-famous sulf, reputed to cure certain kinds of eye disease. Now, this is where it gets very interesting because he says, you do not have ointment to see. Another solve supposedly yield ear problems 
and people came from all over the Roman world in search of remedies for their ailments. So when we read what it says to the Lydosians, he's pressing on all these things that they are using as their, as their, their, um, to their benefit. Things like their trade, things like their medicine. And if, they, if you remember, they didn't want to buy gold that was refined by the master. Why? You'll have to see as we go on. So these two industries produced a third that multiplied their already vast wealth. And they were bankers. Lydosia became a center of currency exchange and money lending. Cicero, it is said, cashed huge bank drafts there. So huge were its assets that when it was demolished by first century earthquake, the city refused Rome's offer to help because they had so much money they could rebuild it with their own funds. So, why is this important? Because now we begin to understand what Yeshua is rebuking them for. He's reusing everything that they are doing, and it's natural, but at the same time, it is so spiritual. You see, Lydosia had a monopoly in textiles and a world-renowned medical industry and a prosperous financial center. And writers of the ancient world, they speak openly of the envy of Lydosian wealth. Record after record attests to their status. But we know from the scriptures that their one weakness was their water supply. You see, water had to be piped into Lydosia. Cold water could come from the abundant supply at Colossia, but by the time it traveled the 10 or so miles from the cold springs, when it got to them, it was lukewarm. And about six miles away in Hyperpolis were hot springs, but that water too was lukewarm. And when it reached Lydosia, it had no use. You see, whether they piped it in cold or hot water, when it arrived in Lydosia, it was lukewarm. Now the question is, brother and sister, what does Yeshua mean by this metaphor? You see, cold water stimulates and invigorates. Nothing refreshes more than drinking a glass of cold water on a hot day. And hot water? You see, it's useful for health. Not only do we mix it with teas and herbs and broths and the like, but it also works as a solvent good for cleaning just about anything. So what does lukewarm water actually do? Think about it. You see, Yeshua's complaint against the Lydosians is revealed here. It is good for absolutely nothing. The Lydosian is useless to him. Why? Because lukewarm water is an emetic. It makes one vomit. It makes you feel sick. You see, in terms of Yahweh's work, a lukewarm believer is absolutely useless to him. And the other traits of Lydosianism spring from this characteristic of uselessness. You see, as Yeshua is the head of the assembly, Yeshua cannot use people like this at all. Because in that spiritual state, they are absolutely useless. And we need to understand something. We should think of this in terms of biblical symbolism. Water represents what? Water represents the Ruach. These people, brothers and sisters, are saying that they are rich with their knowledge, but they are lacking the spirit of Yahweh to do anything about what they have received. You know, as I read this, Abba Father began to share something new with me in light of what this paper has been touching on, this teaching. And Yeshua rebukes them because they've been saying that they are rich and have need of nothing. You know, today many believers speak this way. They feel that they're getting all the head knowledge they need and that they are better than their brothers. And that in truth, they walk around and say, well, I'm progressing, I'm, I'm learning. But when you ask them to pray and you spend time with them in a spiritual setting, they are actually spiritually dead. Because all they're doing is enriching themselves and neglecting the kingdom of Yeshua and of their father. And you know, Yeshua rebukes them and he says, he says the following, and he says to them the following. He says that they are actually wretched and poor and pitiful as well as naked. Revelation 3.18 says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Only Yeshua can refine this fire. He refines us when we allow the refinement to take place. How do we buy this gold that has been refined in the fire? The currency is our lives by laying it down on a daily basis. You see, these people think that they're rich spiritually, but in actual fact, they are not. 
He says, so that you become rich, spiritually rich in me, and white garments, so that you become dressed, so that the shame of your nakedness might not be shown. And anoint your eyes with ointment. They had all the medicine in the world, but yet they didn't have the right discernment. They didn't have the ointment to be able to see as he wants them to see. That's exactly how it is today. All the head knowledge, all the understanding, but yet they still do not have discernment to see that Yahweh has left their camp. Verse 19 says, As many as I love, I reprove and discipline. So be ardent and repent. There's the key. We need to repent, brothers and sisters. We need to repent. You see, we are to buy gold that has been refined. Yeshua's desire is for you to surrender all your life. Your fears, your failures. He wants you to lay it down at His feet as a good father so that he can refine you we need to lay those things down so that he can make you into the gold that he desires i've said this so many times you know when a goldsmith works with gold he heats it up so much until the dross is able to be scraped off so that his own image can be seen in the gold what image does the world see in you what happens to you when the world pushes you what comes out of you Oil or junk? Brothers and sisters, you cannot buy this gold by your head knowledge. You can only buy this gold from Yeshua. He is the refiner that sits purifying us. And it's only that true cleansing and an intimacy with Him that will give you wealth, a wealth that the world will never know. He says in the Word, I will give you the treasures in dark places they're not dark because they're evil they're dark because they're hidden from those who are profane because they have hands that are defiled they are not as psalm 24 says they do not have hands that are pure hearts that are steadfast clean hands and a pure heart they don't have this so yeah we can't give them the hidden things You see, we are only ready to wear the garments of the wedding once we are pure and clean from the inside out. Once we have matured to where we need to be, from a child into a true disciple. He desires to dress us. He desires to put ointment on our eyes so that we may begin to see the truth of the days that we are in. You know, take note of what his last words were. He said, as many as I love. This is not a word of condemnation. It's a word of love to get you to change so that you will not be found in the camp of the dead, but that you'll be found in the camp of the living. That you will no longer be a child of dead religion, but that you will be a child of his power and presence. Mature in him. You know, he knows he knows that many will not change. He also knows that many are not willing to mature as he desires. That's why so many teachers today are speaking up against and out about what is happening in the Messianic movement because they are feeling the fire of Yahweh, that he is no longer happy with what's going on. This is why those that have heeded the call and have been purified as he desires, they will be the ones that he will use in the final days. They will be the ones that he will use in the final days to pronounce his judgment and reprove his wayward house one last time. And I believe that he will do this in the hope of them changing their hearts. Now, there is another interesting parallel with the garments and those who mature and those that don't. I've spoken so many times in the, in the teaching of Ezekiel, um, in the teaching of the open door, um, as well as the teaching of the covenants and so many others. I, I have spoken about Ezekiel 44. And in those teachings, we have seen that the sons of Zadok, those who are a representation of the ones who remained faithful to David, David being a type and foreshadow of Yeshua, they get to sit with him, with Yahweh at his table in the Holy of Holies. Those that were disobedient, they are regarded as being the sons of Levi in this passage. They get to serve in the outer courts only. They get to serve the people, but they are not serving 
in the Holy of Holies before Yahweh. Now, the reason for this is, I believe, that they have no intimacy with Yahweh. And they also lack the right garments to be able to enter the Holy of Holies. And the reason for this is because of their disobedience. Because they were disobedient, they are not able to stand in the presence of Yahweh. Only the sons of Zadok. And we need to take a look at this. We also need to understand that it's the Ruach, brothers and sisters, that empowers us to be able to stand in the presence of Yahweh. As I said in the very beginning, it says that no flesh may stand in the presence of Yahweh. So we need to be clothed with the garments of righteousness. We need to put on redeemed flesh and we need to live in Him through the power of the Ruach. This is very, very important to understand. We need to be a balanced people. Not only a people of our own knowledge, but we need his fire to change us and to help us to uproot the issues of our hearts. Only the Ruach can help us to do that. This is something, brothers and sisters, this uprooting and the fire and the dealing of with our hearts, it is something that's missing in the Messianic camp. It's almost foreign to them. Now let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 44 and verse 15 onwards. And let's read together. And it says the following, but the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, they kept the charge of my sanctuary. When the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me. And they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith Yahweh. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to do what? To minister unto me. And they shall keep my charge. And it shall come to pass that when they enter in at the gates of the inner court, they shall be clothed with linen garments, and no wool shall come upon them, whilst they minister in the gates of the inner court and within. They shall have linen bonnets upon their heads, and they shall have linen breeches upon their loins. They shall not gird themselves with anything that causes sweat. And they go forth into the outer, into the outer court, even into the outer court to the people. They shall put off their garments wherein they ministered and lay them in the holy chambers. And they shall put on other garments and they shall not sanctify the people with their garments. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to bear with me as we go through this. You see, on a simple level, we see that this was the order that Yahweh wanted. No more would he allow any half-hearted priest to stand in his presence. If Israel repented and returned to Yahweh, they would experience this amazing temple and His presence among them. Yet as I stated, the Father knew that they were not going to change their hearts, just like today, and that only a remnant would repent. Now we need to see this passage on many levels that it's presented to us. Firstly, we need to understand this temple is also the temple in heaven. And we see that those who conform to the image of Yeshua, they are allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. They are the righteous, the faithful, the holy, and the pure. They are the remnant, the 144,000. They are the ones who put on new garments. And garments, these garments that they put on, they allow them to go into the Holy of Holies where they are able to sit at the feet of Yeshua. Now, they are also not allowed to gird themselves with anything that causes sweat. And we know from the book of Genesis that sweat is part of our fallen nature, part of our sinful nature. You see, we cannot enter the Holy of Holies with a hint of flesh. And it's then that we read that they put off their holy garments and place on other garments so that they can go out and minister to the people, lest they sanctify them with their garments. I am of the belief that these garments are redeemed flesh it's talking about the end of days but it's also talking about how we are supposed to approach yahweh today now the sons of zadok are the ones who are blessed to be in the presence of yeshua in this passage as he is their inheritance as you read further on in ezekiel 44 and we need to understand that this is the place of true intimacy to be with yahweh the place of stepping from the outer court the place of death into the Holy of Holies, a place of life, a place of service, a place of dedication to Yeshua's will. And this is the place of walking in the Davidic covenant. It's the place where we are in the realm of kings and priests. And we need to remember that the Davidic covenant is all about worship. It's not only about priesthood, it's about worship. David's fallen tent needs to be restored. And that tent was a tent of worship. 
And today, many are not interested in worship. They are not interested in what that actually means. Worth-ship. True, heartfelt worship. And it's because of this that they are stagnant. You see, the pursuit of wealth in the form of books, knowledge, and power, it's those things that have overtaken people and their desire for, for knowledge has overtaken their desire to do the works of Yeshua and to entertain His presence. Now, the sons of Zadok in this passage, I believe that they represent the royal priesthood. Pardon me. Whereas the Levites represents those that are still stuck in the old. You see, they don't want intimacy. They don't want, they don't want to be intimate and be intimate with Yahweh. Instead, they want power and prestige. They want the people to worship them. They want the people to acknowledge their hierarchy. And the Levites in the story are a representation, I believe, of those that are stuck in the Mosaic Covenant. Those that are stuck in the Messianic movement today. That are not willing to mature into sons and daughters of righteousness. Instead, they are still stuck in the old priesthood. They are stuck in the, the places where there is no Ruach. And they are stuck in the old way. And the reason for this is they didn't move on due to their own disobedience. They lacked the discernment to be able to see and hear when Yeshua told them that there is a change that needs to take place. They didn't deal with the heart. And if you don't deal with the heart, you cannot be filled up to overflowing because there are certain places in your life that, that need to be uprooted in order for the Spirit to fill those places. Now, there is so much symbolism in this one passage as it relates to our walk with Yeshua at this present time. You see, I believe that the garments that Yeshua is speaking about are not only the wedding garments per se, but they are actually the priestly garments that the sons of Zadok have because of their obedience and love for him. You see, because these sons of Zadok, those who remained faithful to David, it's a type and foreshadow of those who will remain faithful to Yeshua in a time of great distress. The true remnant, the true priesthood. Because of their obedience and love for him, they have these garments because they chose to mature and seek his will these people truly dealt with their hearts every festival when yahweh spoke they listened they changed they matured they allowed his fire to purify them whereas those in lydosia as we read they don't have the right garments. They are actually considered to be naked. And I believe that these garments are not just garments that are that are saying, hey, I'm a believer. It's the priestly garments. They lack the discernment to truly understand the message that Yahweh is doing a new thing and that he's calling to people to mature so that they can become priests. You know, today, many in the Messianic faith, as I said, deny Yeshua as the Messiah and they refuse the working of the Ruach. Brothers and sisters, I ask you with my heart open, what is happening? What is happening in the body today? See, Yeshua has moved camp, yet many are still happy to stay in the places where there is no water. Instead, they stay at old, stinky, watering wells. Jeremiah says, my people have, have, have committed a grave sin. They have tried to collect water in old and dry, cracked pots that's what's happening today a while back i did a teaching called come out of her my people and it was directed to the messianic faith and each covenant as i said is progressive we are never called to set up camp at salvation or at the study of torah no our salvation was meant to change us so that we can obey the torah and continue to mature into a son and daughter of righteousness one who looks like our elder brother yeshua not like a man-made religion of knowledge that has absolutely no power at all and that is what the messianic faith has become a religion of words with absolutely no power you know, the congregation of Philadelphia is the righteous congregation, the sons of Zadok that have chosen to mature and grow up. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11, it says, See, I am coming speedily. Hold to what you have, that no one take your crown. Speaking about inheritance. He who overcomes, I shall make him a supporting post in the dwelling place of my Elohim. And he shall by no means go out. And I shall write on him the name of my Elohim and the name of the city of my Elohim, the renewed Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my Elohim and my renewed name. You see, the congregation in Philadelphia, they are the congregation that overcomes and they will be the ones who become the pillars of inheritance. A pillar 
or better yet, an unshaken one. Before the priests were called priests, they were called the pillars of Yahweh's temple. That is what he's saying. They will be called priests in my dwelling place. A reference to where the sons of Zadok stand in the book of, of Ezekiel chapter 44. And this is also where he says that I will write upon them the new unknown name of Messiah. And I believe the allusion is to the golden frontlet inscribed with the name of Yahweh. In Revelation chapter 22 verse 4 it says, And they shall see his face and his name shall be upon their foreheads. Now take notice that we see the name also on 144,000 which are the first fruits. And in Revelation chapter 7 verse 3, we've done this before in previous teachings, but I feel it's important to just cap on it. In Revelation chapter 7 verse 3, it says, saying, Do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our Elohim upon their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, the remnant, sealed out of the tribes of the children of Israel. Brothers and sisters, I hope that you are seeing that these have had an identity change. They have matured to the status of priests, and they have been given a new name. And they are those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. What does that mean? It speaks about an intimate relationship with Yeshua. To follow the Lamb wherever He goes means that you have ears to hear and eyes to see. The call that has been from the very beginning to all these seven congregations was what? Blessed is he who has eyes to see and ears to hear. That only happens by walking by the Spirit and being rooted in Messiah Yeshua. Not being rooted in the Torah. Brothers and sisters, there is a time that no eye has seen coming upon this earth. Yahweh is calling his remnant to a place of power and a place of war. War in the spiritual realm. War not as the world knows. War on their knees in prayer. That's why it's so important to be prayer warriors. You know, the scriptures say that Elijah was a man like you and I. Yet when he prayed, Things happened. The rain stopped. This final remnant will know the heart of their creator. And they will understand the message. And I believe that the message will not be foreign to them. The message will resonate in their spirits. It will touch the core within them. And they will understand it. Brothers and sisters, Yahweh wants you to know that the door is about to open. I believe the door is already swung wide open. The door for the opportunity to do his work before the end of the end begins. In other words, before the time of great trouble. Now getting back to what we were saying, we need to understand and, and what needs to be noted is that there is a clear distinction between the work of the 144, which are the true priests of Yahweh and the great multitude. And this is the same as what we saw with the sons of Zadok and the rest of the Levites. We saw that the sons of Zadok are allowed into the Holy of Holies, whereas the Levites are only allowed to serve in the temple. And this is actually very, very important to understand. You know, today the leaders to the Messianic faith are happier to serve the people only than to truly serve Yahweh. You see, it's easier to serve the people, to teach and teach and teach and teach, but it takes something from you to actually stand in the presence of Yahweh and learn to serve Him. To allow Him to refine your heart as well as your character. You see, it's in the inner chamber that you're truly changed and you're able to go out and change a nation, not just individuals, but a nation by the power of a holy life and the spirit of Yahweh living in you. You know, today we are happier to teach people instead of live a holy life. We are happier to teach them about things and about a deeper understanding than to actually stand in front and be a gatekeeper that just prays and allows the presence of Yahweh to flow and to change the lives of people. You know, we see a similarity of this in the life of Saul and David. And we have spoken about both of them often in teachings. And the truth is that Saul's life speaks of those in the Messianic faith today. You see, Saul had a serious problem in that whenever he sought to speak to Yahweh, he did it through Samuel. He always needed a mediator. And this is how many in the Messianic faith have become. They are happier to listen to the teachers than to pursue an intimate relationship with Yeshua that will cost them both time and effort. The other interesting thing is that Saul also hated David. 
he actually sought to take his life because David was a man after Yahweh's heart, a man of true worship. And it was the tabernacle of David that Yahweh desired to rebuild due to the fact that it was a place of intimacy and worship. Acts chapter 15 tells us that that tabernacle is being restored. And it's also only, as I said, in the Davidic covenant, it's that covenant that holds the twofold anointing of king and priest. This is why those who remain in the camp of Saul, those who remain in the messy, antic camp, they will always seek a mediator and they will always seek to kill those who desire to walk in the Davidic covenant. Brothers and sisters, the true royal priesthood of Messiah and his priests is not found in the Mosaic covenant. It is found in walking in all the covenants and maturing into the image of Yeshua. You see, brothers and sisters, many today in the messianic camp, they simply do not want to acknowledge the change of priesthood and the importance of this covenant, the importance of the Davidic covenant. And the reason for this is once again, because they do not seek the refinement of Yeshua, the refinement of their hearts, of their thoughts and of their lives. They instead said, just like the Lydosians, hey, you know what? We're rich and we are in need of nothing. Yet in actual fact, they are naked and blind. They are lacking the priestly garments. Brothers and sisters, the time of the restoration of the fallen tent of David is at hand. And those that choose not to take hold of the new thing that Yahweh is doing and repent of their half-heartedness and religious hearts will simply form part of the great multitude. They will have no right to be in the Holy of Holies and they will not stand as priests to teach the people the difference between the holy and the profane. That duty is given over to the sons and daughters of righteousness, those walking in the Davidic covenant, those that have gone from salvation, applied everything, taken what the Torah has taught them, living the Torah out and applying it to their lives. But now they are becoming the image of Yeshua and they are doing it with great signs and wonders following them. You see, no matter how well you think you know the Torah, it will mean nothing if you choose not to change your heart and if you reject the fire of Yahweh and your first love. Like I said, it seems that most are happy to be part of the great multitude. In Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, it says the following, it says, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all the nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our Elohim, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped Yahweh, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our Elohim forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are those that are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And he said unto me, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are they, these are those which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of Yahweh and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither the sun light on, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. Now what's interesting is that the great multitude serve in the temple as I have shown you throughout all the teachings, whereas the 144,000 are on Mount Zion and get to be in the Holy of Holies. Let's have a look at what it says in Revelation 21 verse 9 to, 21, verse 9 to 17. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked to me saying, Come here and I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from Elohim. Having the glory of Elohim and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a great high wall. 
and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the walls of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And they measured the city with a reed, twelve thousand furlongs. The length and the breadth of the height are equal. And he measured the wall thereof a hundred and forty-four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. Now what's important to see here is that the dimensions of the city actually correspond to the 144,000. They are 12,000 by 12 or 12 by 12. What does this mean? You see, brothers and sisters, the 144,000, the remnant, have an intimate relationship with the Lamb and they share in His throne. Now isn't this interesting in light of covenant? You see, brothers and sisters, Yahweh has been speaking, yet many have not been listening. His call has been to mature, to realize that covenant is more than just a word. It's the life that you and I are supposed to live. Brothers and sisters, those who remain in the church are still there. Those that are going to remain in the Messianic camp, they are going to remain there. And the rest will move and they will continue in the covenants of Yahweh. And they will be the ones that will partake of this inheritance and have an intimate relationship with the Lamb. You see, we are meant to mature so that we can be the priests that He wanted priests in the order of Melchizedek. Yet we see from scripture that in the days of Elijah only 7,000 did not bow to Baal. Today the number 144,000 might freak you out. Yet this is the number Yahweh is saying will be found blameless. And they will be the ones who would have listened, obeyed and entered into all the covenants. Brothers and sisters, I believe that they will be used by him in this final generation to do those things that are spoken about during the time of the latter rain. We see that the 144,000 are those who have the right to sit on the throne, which is a place of inheritance, a place of sonship, and a place of authority. This remnant will have the authority of Yahweh upon them, and we also see that the seal will be upon their forehead. Now, this is where it gets interesting, because many have argued about what the seal really is, and I believe it's the mark that says that we are set apart unto Yahweh, But we see the sealing of the apostles on their forehead too. And what was it? It was the Ruach. Something that is missing in the Messianic faith today is the Ruach. Let's have a look at what it says in Ephesians. And Ephesians helps us better understand the seal. And it says this, In whom you also trusted, after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. You know, I think that it's pretty plain to see that those who reject the Ruach are in grave danger. Those that deny Messiah are in even worse danger, and they will be spat out of his mouth, as it says in the in the book of Pardon me to the congregation of Lydosia. And they will have no part of him in this final generation. You know, brothers and sisters, today, the great apostasy is not going to be that people reject Christianity or that they reject the Ruach. I believe the great, great apostasy is that those who once believed that Yeshua is the Messiah will deny him and embrace Judaism and all false forms of Kabbalistic things. You know, the Messianic faith is in grave danger at present and needs to repent and return to Yeshua. They need to repent of making the Torah into an idol. For teaching people half-truth and for not listening when Yeshua warned them to repent. You know, over and over He has been calling to them to repent and return to their first love, to examine their walk and to repent of their hard issues. Yet they've forgotten things like the Great Commission, like I said, and becoming, they have become a religious people that are void of His power and presence. Now, brothers and sisters, I'd like to share with you something that is happening within the Messianic faith. So many people are denying they're, they're, they're denying that Yeshua is the Messiah. And the reason for this is the following. And I know that there are many Messianics that believe this. And the truth of the matter is that we need to reevaluate what the Scriptures say. Because if we don't, we are falsely teaching things to people. And it's because of this falsehood that many feel that, oh, okay, so if Yeshua is the living Torah, 
then I don't have to really, you know, have a relationship with him. I just got to do Torah, 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 Torah. They also believe that the Torah, that, that he is the Torah in the flesh, which is not true. They also believe that Yeshua is one with the Torah. And I'm going to show you that nowhere in the scriptures does it ever say that. It never says, Yeshua himself never says that he is the living Torah. He says many other things about himself, but he never says that he is the living Torah. He also never says that he is the Torah in the flesh or that he is one with the Torah. Now, the Brit Chedasha and the Torah clearly instructs us that Yeshua is none other, Yim Yad. Yeshua is none other than Yahweh manifest in the flesh, and he is not the Torah. You know, there are many teachers that cannot reconcile the oneness of Yahweh with the presence of the Messiah and have become unteachable by rejecting the testimony of the apostles and replacing accurate teachings on the oneness of Yahweh for false things. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand that the oneness of Yahweh and the manifestation of His presence is very, very important to understand. These teachers need to correct their tradition. They also need to ensure that their teachings are in conformance with the Torah, the Tanakh, as well as the Brit Chadash. Now let us keep in mind that if you are fruit, it doesn't mean you are an apple. If you are an apple, you certainly are a fruit. Now to assume you are an apple because you are a fruit, simply because the second statement is true, is not only illogical, but it's naturally and fundamentally and genetically wrong. You see, the scripture affirms that Yeshua is Yahweh manifest in the flesh. Being the utterance of Yahweh, the word, does not mean that you are the Torah. The apostles confirm this fact actually in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. It says the following, But if I delay that you might know how you should behave in the house of Elohim, which is the assembly of the living Elohim, a strong support and foundation of the truth. And beyond all question, the secret of reverence is great, who was revealed in the flesh, declared right in spirit, was seen by messengers, was proclaimed among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in esteem. And you know, many are offended because of this great truth. And we read about it in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 2. And it says, And when Yochanan had heard in the prison of the works of Messiah, he sent two of his taught ones and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And Yeshua answered and said to them, Go report to Yochanan what you hear and see. Blind receive sight and lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and deaf hear. Dead are raised up and poor are brought the good news. And blessed is he who does not stumble in me. You see, brothers and sisters, there are many messianics and two house messianics that are offended by this great truth. Notice there is no blessing for those who are offended in the Messiah. So counter to the modern trend of our culture, just because you are offended by this truth, it does not make the other person wrong because you either cannot or will not accept the truth. You see, the person who does not accept this truth is, uh, pardon me, the person who does accept this truth, they are the ones that are blessed. And Paul confirms this for us that Yeshua is not the Torah. Let's take a look at what it says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is then now no condemnation to those who are in Messiah Yeshua, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the Torah of the Spirit of the life in Messiah Yeshua has set me free from the law of sin and death. For the Torah being powerless in that it was weak through the flesh, Elohim, having his own Son in the likeness of flesh of sin, and concerning sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Now, brothers and sisters, Paul, Rav Shul, He's incredibly clear about this truth. Continually he says, Yeshua is not the living Torah or the Torah in the flesh. Yeshua is the manifest name of Yahweh. He's the image of Yahweh, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the countenance of Yahweh, the one name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Yeshua the Messiah is Yahweh manifest in the flesh. You see, the Torah could not deliver man from sin and death. It was weak through the flesh, and we know that. It could not do what needed to be done for our redemption. It could not serve as a propitiation. So Yahweh did not send the Torah in the flesh for our deliverance. He sent His own Son. And the blessing is only for those who are not offended in Him. You see, the first giving of the Torah is associated with the law in your flesh, sin. 
And that first giving of the Torah caused death and needed to be done away. Not the Torah done away, but the first giving of the Torah. It was then resurrected to life through the Spirit, which is done by who? By the Son of Elohim, the manifest name of Yahweh, Yeshua, the Messiah, so that it can now bring you and me life. Because why? Because you and I by nature are sinful. We are fleshly. Brothers and sisters, I say it again. Yeshua is not the Torah. He is the manifestation of Yahweh in the flesh. You see, the Torah could not save you. It only condemned you. Hence why Rav Shul clearly contrasts the difference between the Torah and the Son. The Torah brought death. The Son, Yahweh manifest in the flesh, He brings us life. Let's look at what, that, what it says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. It says, and we know that whatever the Torah says, it says to those who are in the Torah, so that every mouth might be stopped and all the world come under judgment before Elohim. Therefore, by the works of Torah, no flesh shall be declared right before him. For by the Torah is the knowledge of sin. But now apart from the Torah, a righteousness of Elohim has been revealed, being witnessed by the Torah and the prophets. And the righteousness of Elohim is through belief in Yeshua the Messiah to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and all fallen short of the esteem of Elohim, being declared right without paying by his favor through the redemption which is in Messiah Yeshua, whom Elohim set forth as an atonement through belief in his blood, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his tolerance Elohim had passed over the sins that had taken place before, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he is righteous and declares righteous the one who has belief in Yeshua. Brothers and sisters, the bottom line is that we need to have belief in Messiah Yeshua. We cannot deny him and keep the Torah and think that we are declared righteous. We are not. See, in this passage is beautifully clear. The manifestation of Yahweh's righteousness is his son. It occurred without the law, Torah. It occurred without the law because Yeshua, who is the son of Yahweh, the manifest name of Yahweh, he is the righteousness of Elohim. He was manifested as a propitiation through faith in what? In his blood, not faith in the Torah. Notice Paul says, but now the righteousness of Elohim without the law is manifested. You see, brothers and sisters, there is no doubt. Yeshua is not the Torah made flesh or the living Torah. Like I said, the Brit Chadash is clear that Yeshua is Yahweh manifest in the flesh. I read it to you in 1 Timothy 3 verse 16. It says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Elohim was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. You see, messianics that say the Messiah is the Torah in the flesh or the living Torah are in reality saying that the Torah is Yahweh. And this is unscriptural. This means that they are worshipping the Torah as an idol. And again, to be the word of Yahweh does not make you the Torah. To be the Aleph and the Tav does not make you the alphabet. I am made in the image of Yahweh. Am I therefore Yahweh? No! Is the vessel the life or does the vessel carry the life is the lamp the fire no it's simply the lamp that carries the fire i am a lamp am i god no matthew chapter 5 in verse 14 says the following you are the light of the world it is impossible for a city to be hidden on a mountain nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand and it shines to all those in the house. Let your light so shine before men, so that they see your good works, and praise your Father who is in the heavens. Do not think I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to complete, to correctly interpret the Scriptures. For truly I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall by no means pass from the Torah till all is done. Now many have quoted and said, oh, but the heavens and the earth will never pass away. That's false. At the end of days, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So this will pass away. Now like I said, I am a light, but I am not Yahweh. 
Many claim that the Torah is a lamp into their feet, and Yeshua is the light of the world. Therefore, Yeshua is the living Torah. Brothers and sisters, if I use the logic of those who claim the Messiah is the living Torah or the Torah in the flesh, then by extension you could say, I am also a lamp, therefore I am Elohim. It just doesn't work. Now notice verse 18 is clear. One day the Torah will not be necessary. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18 says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till it all be fulfilled. We know at the end of days there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And you know, brothers and sisters, if we follow these people's logic, Yahweh and Yeshua will someday then pass away. And this is clearly unscriptural. Yeshua is not the living Torah or the Torah in the flesh. Yahweh and Yeshua are not going to pass away. Remember at the first giving of the Torah, the manifest name of Yahweh is not present. But he is at the second giving of the Torah in Exodus chapter 34. And Moshe immediately bows and worships the manifest name of Yahweh at the second giving of the Torah. He worships the express image of Yahweh, which is the Messiah. You see, the first giving of the Torah is associated with death. And the second giving of the Torah is associated with resurrected life and the countenance of Yahweh, the Messiah. Brothers and sisters, the Torah will not save you. That is the work of the resurrected administrator of the resurrected Torah, the resurrected covenant. It is the work of Messiah Yeshua, who is the manifest name of Yahweh. So what does this mean? You see, if you are a Messianic Jew and you have not accepted that Messiah Yeshua is literally the manifest name of Yahweh, then you are still under the administration of condemnation and death. You are still under the Torah of sin and death. You need to acknowledge the resurrected manifest name of Yahweh. You need to acknowledge the new administrator of the resurrected covenant, the Torah of Moshe. You need to administer, you need to, to acknowledge that minister of that resurrected covenant, Yeshua HaMashiach. You need to confess him as your Messiah. You have to. So brothers and sisters, what is the final word on the matter? Are you grafted into the Torah? Is the Torah the way or is Yeshua the way? Rav Shul is clear that it is not the Torah that saves you. It is the new and living way, the Messiah Yeshua that saves you. So the question then is, what tree are you grafted into? Ephesians chapter 3 in verse 9 says the following onwards. And to make all see the secret that is administered, which for ages past has been hidden in Elohim, who created all through Yeshua the Messiah, so that now through the assembly the many-sided wisdom of Elohim might be known to the principalities and authorities in the heavenlies, according to the everlasting purpose which he made in Messiah Yeshua our Master, in whom we have boldness and access with reliance through belief in him. I pray therefore that you do not lose heart at my pressures on your behalf, which is your esteem. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Master Yeshua the Messiah, from whom all fatherhood in the heavens and earth is named, in order that he might give you according to the riches of his esteem by power, to be strengthened in the inner man through his Ruach, that the Messiah might, pardon me, might dwell in your hearts through belief, having become rooted and grounded in love in order that you might be strengthened to firmly grasp with all the set-apart ones what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Messiah which surpasses knowledge, in order that you might be filled to the completeness of Elohim, and to Him who is able to do exceedingly above what we ask or think, according to the power that is working in us. To Him be the esteem in the assembly by Messiah Yeshua, and to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we are grafted and rooted by faith in the root. The root is Yeshua the Messiah, the manifest name of Yahweh, the express image of Yahweh, the fullness of Yahweh, because the fullness of Yahweh lives within him. We are not grafted into Israel or Judah or the Torah, as so many messiantics are saying today. 
The tree is the tree of faith. It is not the tree of the Hebrew roots. It is not the tree of Israel. It is not the tree of, of Judah. It is not the tree of, 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 of the Torah. No. We are grafted and rooted by faith in the root, which is Yeshua the Messiah, the manifest name of Yahweh. That is what we need to understand. And the tree is the tree of faith in that manifest presence of Elohim. The name of Yahweh made manifest in the world, which is Yeshua HaMashiach. He is none other than the son of Elohim. We are not rooted in the Torah. And the tree is not the Torah. The tree is also not Israel or Judah. The tree is faith in Messiah Yeshua. Those who exhibit that faith remain grafted in to that tree. Those who do not exhibit faith in Yeshua the Messiah have their branches cut off from the tree. Brothers and sisters, I leave you with Colossians 2, 6, 7, and 8. Therefore, as you accepted Messiah Yeshua the Master, walk in Him, having been rooted and built up in Him and established in the belief in your faith as you were taught from the very beginning, overflowing in it with thanksgiving. See to it that no one makes a prey of you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, the understanding of men, according to the elementary matters of the world, and not according to the Messiah. We need to notice the testimony of the apostles is clear. We are to be grafted into the, and grafted into and rooted in the Messiah, not the Torah. And this rooting occurs by and is established by faith. A clear and persistent warning, brothers and sisters, is given to those who disregard this plain truth. Beware the traditions of men. The traditions of men that teach other than this truth. How do we know if it's other than this truth? It will teach you your salvation through a way that is not the Messiah Yeshua. Because people subtly twist the truth and present you a lie. It's time that we come out of the places of messy antics and mature into the head, which is Yeshua. We've been called to walk as He did and do His works. That is not just keeping the Torah, it's doing the Great Commission and fulfilling His words. Beware of those that try to spoil you through vain philosophy and teach against the true priesthood and walking by the Ruach. Have nothing to do with such people. Brothers and sisters, I hope that you've come to understand that Yeshua is not the Torah. We keep his Torah so that we can become the express image of Yeshua. But Yeshua is the manifest name of Yahweh. He came in the fullness of his Father to reveal his Father's will and character. And that is so important. People today have made an idol out of the Torah and they are now denying Yeshua as being the son of Elohim. Let us not get these two things confused and begin to take the signs and symbols in the scriptures and twist them and become people who land up being apostates. Brothers and sisters, I pray that this teaching has blessed you. Once again, there's been a lot of information to digest, but I know that by the power of Yahweh's spirit, you will be able to digest it, put it in your spirit and go out there and make a difference. Let Yeshua be your source. Let us be rooted in Him and let us be His radiance upon the earth. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the wonderful and powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach. And Father, I want to pray, Father, over your people. I pray, Father, that they will no longer be found in places where there is death, but Father, that they will be found in places of power, places, Father, where your Spirit is talking to them, Father, where your Spirit is changing them, renewing them. Father, I pray that they will not make idols out of their Torah studies, that they will not make idols, Father, out of the Torah, but Father, that they will live and move and have their being in Messiah Yeshua, rooted up in Him, filled with His Spirit, going out into the nations making a difference father i pray that they will not be of those that are lukewarm that will be spat out of the mouth of yeshua in this final generation but instead that they will be of those like the those in the congregation of philadelphia father doing the works of yeshua holding firm to what they have and not denying his great name the name that is above every other name the name of yeshua hamashiach the one and only way that we can be saved is through him and him alone father may we be of those that do not deny our faith but live and move and have our being in you father we thank you for this teaching i pray a blessing upon all your people may they go out with joy and be led forth with peace 
In Yeshua Mashiach's name we pray. Amen. Again, I thank you for joining me. I hope to see you again in the next teaching. May Yahweh bless you. May Yahweh keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and give you shalom. Amen. Amen.